Welcome to part three of the neural network tutorial. In this video, we're gonna use an evolution simulator to train the neural network that we created in part two of this series. If you haven't seen part one or two, I recommend you watch them first. A link to them will be in the description below. Before we jump into the code, let's start off by learning how an evolution simulator actually works and how it can be used to train a neural network. To start off, there are three main things that we're gonna need for an evolution simulator to work. That's reproduction, random mutations, and competition. I didn't come up with these requirements myself. You can thank our old friend, Charles Darwin, for discovering these. Let's start with competition. To add the competition, we'll add a shared resource for these creatures to compete over. In this case, it's going to be these apples that spawn randomly throughout the map periodically. The creature will have an energy resource and the creature will lose one energy every second. If they run out of energy, they'll die. So the creatures can gain more energy by eating the apples. To satisfy the reproduction requirement, if they eat a few apples in a row, they'll reproduce. And to satisfy the mutation requirement, when they reproduce, we will make random mutations to the network's weights and biases. And these changes might be beneficial or they might be harmful to the creature. If enough of these changes are good, then there's a chance that this creature will perform better than all the other creatures and it will have an easier time surviving, which means it will also reproduce more than the other creatures and spread its traits around more. One thing to keep in mind is that in an evolution simulator, the creatures don't learn when they're surviving and they're moving around. They actually learn when they reproduce. So the children don't learn while they're alive, they learn when they're born through the mutations. So now that we know how all of that works, we can move on to setting up our simulation in Unity. I won't focus too much on the environment creation here because basically I just added a ground some trees and a nice looking skybox. The first thing we should do before we actually create the creatures is spawn some food on the map. To do that, I created the script, which creates these apple objects. And first it picks a random location on the map, and then it creates an instance of the apple object at that location. I made this loop run 100 times at the very beginning of the simulation. So that way we could ha just have the map pre-populated with apples. After that happens, it will call it periodically, maybe every second or so. And this way the creatures will never run out of food because they just keep popping up over time. And once we have all this food on the map, we can start creating our creatures. Features. To do that, I actually just copied and pasted most of these spawner scripts to change them from spawning food to spawning creatures. The way that this works is if there are no creatures on the map, it will spawn one creature. And if that creature dies, it will just spawn another. So this way they'll never go extinct because it will always just recreate another creature. And once the creatures spawn, we need them to actually do something. So I created a movement script that all of our creatures have. This basically just allows our creatures to move forward or backwards or turn left or right. And I actually disabled the backward movement because previously I was having issues where they were all learning to go backwards and I just didn't really care if they went backwards or not. So I just disabled that by clamping values between zero and one, so it's always positive, so they move forward. But basically our creatures are able to move around and it, that movement is controlled by two variables, the left-right movement and the forward-backward speed. And if you want to control how fast the creatures are moving or turning, there are variables in the code that you can adjust to modify those values. Now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take these movement variables and connect them to the outputs of our neural network. So that way the neural network will be the thing that controls the movement of the creature. But before we do that, let's actually give the creature the ability to eat some food, because currently there's food on the map and there are creatures on the map, but they're just phasing through each other and nothing's actually happening. So to do that, Unity has this built-in function called a trigger, or you can also use a collider, but trigger worked better in this case for me. And basically what a trigger does is if two objects are overlapping, it triggers an event. And that event is this function right here, which basically just increases the amount of energy that the creature has, and also adds some reproduction energy, which we will use later to control when the creature reproduces. And then it also destroys the food object. And now our creature can eat the food. To use these energy resources, we're going to create another function, which is going to be our energy manager for the entire creature. And that function's name is rightfully manage energy. So this function decreases the creature's energy by one energy every second. And if that energy level gets to zero, the creature dies. The creature will also die if it falls off of the map. And then there's this second energy, which is called the reproduction energy. And if it passes a certain value, in this case, I set it to two, the creature will reproduce. But you could change how many pieces of food it takes for the creature to reproduce. You can make one, three, whatever you want. And to actually perform this reproduction, we call this reproduce function, which we create here. And this function is the one that I mentioned earlier, where it creates a new instance of a creature somewhere near the parent, but then it also takes the neural network from the parent and copies it to the creature using this copy layers function that we have in the neural network. And this copy layers function is actually a new function in our neural network script. And it basically just takes all of the layers and weights and biases of the parent and copies it to the child. It's not as simple as just copying and pasting the entire class because that would make a shallow copy. And when I did that, the values were linked between the child and parent. So that way, if one of them got mutated, they would all get mutated. So they all basically had the same values and were performing the exact same way, even though they're supposed to be separate 
entities. So in order to make them separate, I had to do a deep copy with this temporary layer and copying it. And basically this just makes it so that way they're actually separate values that can change independently. Okay, so now we have the creatures and the food set up and also some reproduction. Now we have to connect the neural networks that are in our creatures to the actual controls of the brain. So to connect the neural network to our creatures movement controller, all we have to do is use the brain function that we made in the previous video. And the outputs of that brain function are the decisions that the network makes. We take Take those decisions and all we have to do is get them as outputs from the function and use them as the inputs for our move function right after that. And that's all that we actually need to do to give the neural network access to the controls of the creature. But it's just going to output zeros right now because we aren't giving it any information about the world so the creatures just won't make any decisions. So to fix that we have to somehow give our creatures information about the environment. In the original evolution simulator I was using the position of the closest piece of food as the input to the neural network and I feel like that's kind of cheating because we were kind of giving the creature the answer to which piece of food it should go towards. So in this simulation, I thought it would be more interesting to just use raycasts. And I've used them before in my self-driving car simulation. And I think that using them for this one will also be more interesting because they'll be able to learn more unique behaviors than just being given which food they should go towards. And to actually put the raycasts on the creature, I made this create raycasts function. And this function can create as many raycasts as you want. And you could decide how spread out they are too. So if you want like five of them, but you want them very tight together, you could do that. Or if you want them really spread out, you could also do that. And I won't go into too much detail of how this works because it's not very specific to neural networks. But if you want to pause it and take a look at it to understand it, I tried to comment it pretty well. And these raycasts return the distance that an object is away from the creature. So in this case, I have it only triggering when it sees a piece of food. So it'll just pass through like trees and other creatures. But when it sees a piece of food, it will just return the distance that food is for that specific ray. So you can have multiple rays and they each can have their own distances and see different pieces of food at the same time. And now that we have this function, we could use the outputs of the create raycasts function as the input to our network because that will be an array of all of the lengths of these raycasts. Now our neural network has inputs that it can get from the environment and it can actually create outputs that mean something. After you figure out how many inputs and outputs your network has, you have to set the shape of your network at the top of the file for this variable here. And to do that, it just goes left to right for each layer in the network. So the input layer would be the first one and the output would be the last. And any layers that you put in the in-between numbers will be hidden layers. And it will automatically create these layers for you. You do not need to do anything to create the layers. You just need to make sure that your inputs and outputs match the inputs and outputs of your functions. So in this case, we have five raycasts, and then we have two outputs to control the forward, backward, and then the left, right movement. And we are almost done. We only have one thing left to do because our simulation is all set up. We're reproducing. We have the neural network hooked up, but there is no actual learning going on right now because in order for learning to happen, we need some mutation. In order to add mutation, we need to create a randomness function that will randomly modify the values of the neural networks when the creature reproduces. And to add mutations, I created this mutate creature function. And this function is just where I could put traits or things that get mutated on the creature. And because this is an evolution simulator, we could actually mutate more than just the neural network. And if you go back to the original evolution simulator video, you'll see that I had the size and the speed of the creature as traits. This function just allows you to add that capability back if you feel like it, because this is where you would mutate the size and speed. I made the mutation chance and the mutation amount traits of the creature because sometimes it can be hard to figure those values out on your own. So what I did is just set them both at a starting value and now they can actually evolve over time with the network. So normally you would figure these out in a regular network that wasn't an evolution simulator. You try to figure out the best values for these. But since we're in an evolution simulator, we can actually evolve more things than just the network. So that's something that I did here that was a little extra. But all of the code at the top of this function is optional. The only thing that we need is this one line of code, which actually mutates the network. This function loops over all of the layers in our neural network, and it modifies all of the weights and biases for each of those layers using this mutate layer function. So this mutate layer function gets called on a specific layer. And inside of that layer, we have our nodes and each node has weights and biases associated with it. So it goes one node at a time and it picks the first node and then it will modify some of the weights. It doesn't mutate all of the weights because of this mutation chance variable, because you actually don't want all of the weights changing all the time, because then the entire network will be completely different. and It will be hard to tell which changes were good and which ones were bad. This mutation chance just says maybe like 50% of the nodes will be changed and you could adjust this value based on what you want. And then if it should get changed, we mutate it by a small amount, which is decided by the mutation amount. And we do this for all of the weights on this node. And then we do the same exact thing for the bias after 
after we finish that. And since there's only one of them, we don't need a loop. We just mutate it if it should get mutated. So after we do this for the first node, we mutate all of the weights and biases. We just move on to the next one, do the same thing, move on to the next one until we run out of nodes. And then the entire layer is mutated. And then from our previous function, that will call the next layer. And basically we'll go layer by layer, node by node, and the entire network will be mutated. So in order to use this mutate creature function, I put it at the very start of our loop for our creature. I didn't put it in the start function because we want the values to get copied from the parent to the child first, but those are an exact copy. And then after we get that exact copy, we mutate it. So whether the creature is created from a parent or it gets created from scratch, this mutate creature function gets called in both cases. All right, so now that we have the network connected, we can start our simulation and just see what happens. In the beginning, there isn't really too much to see because you just see one creature maybe respawn and die over and over again until it actually figures out how to eat food. Or maybe the map just gets so filled with food that no matter what strategy it figures out, it survives. But then after it starts reproducing, you can see that some of the children are performing some patterns. It's not really a strategy yet, but they're maybe doing circles in a certain way that allows them to cover more ground, which in return allows them to eat more food than, than others. And because they're eating more food, they are reproducing. And because they're reproducing more, they're getting more children with similar brains to them with slight mutations. So that means that that strategy has a chance of becoming better and better over time because more creatures are using it. Since this is an evolution simulator, it's obviously not a perfect training ground for neural networks because maybe the best solution that it finds is just the first one that it found. Because the creatures found out how to spin a certain way and then all of the other ones do it and they, they figure out that's the best way and it would be hard for them to learn a new way because that would mean making backwards progress, which can't happen in evolution because if one of the creatures is worse than the others, it doesn't really have a chance to test things out for a while to learn a new way. You just have to use the current best solution and modify it to slowly get better and better in small incremental steps. And that's why there are different ways of training neural networks like genetic algorithms, which is a slight step up over an evolution simulator. And beyond that, you have things like back propagation or actor critic training strategies where there is a neural network that is like a judge and one that is performing and they basically train each other. So this video series was basically the first stepping stone into the world of artificial intelligence. And I hope that these videos encourage you to take the next step. If you guys enjoyed this video, I definitely recommend you check out the self-driving car video next because in that video, I used a genetic algorithm to train the cars. And that's basically just one step above a evolution simulator. So if you're interested, go check that out. And as always, I will see you guys in the next one.